Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hey, now. I am Justin Lurie, and of course, I am joined by the Rick Walker. Hello, everyone. Uh, you may think of him because he reminds me, I might remind you, of Mitt Romney. Maybe. I'll, I'll take it. I'll, I'll take it. I told him I was going to say that. Uh, you, Rick is very famous for one being a big, big name Kingwood businessman. And then we are in his offices. And then also Rick famously ran for Congress. And of course, that's how we know each other. Uh, we'll call it CD2 alumni. We'll make, uh, we'll make a group. All right, so we'll talk tonight. We'll talk about Rick. We'll talk about the business. We'll talk about politics. We'll talk about life in a campaign. And we'll talk about some current issues. As always, while I'm looking for your comments, I'm looking for your questions, we'll keep reading them live as we go. All right, so first, Rick is the founder, he is the CEO of Green Efficient. It's primarily a commercial real estate firm and brokerage and a management company. Let me read the notes, make sure I get it right. They provide the tech needed to achieve lead status, L-E-E-D. Started the company, as I remember, I heard the story so many times during his speeches. I'm going to use the right word. You ready? Yes. Rick was entrusted. That's right. He was entrusted with the final $1,000 in his family's uh, multi-million dollar trust. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was an exaggeration. They basically said, Rick, take this ticket to America, this $1,000. <laughs> and go build a commercial real estate empire. And that's what he's done uh, over 20 years. He was entrusted. He's also the deacon of his church, his Baptist church up in Kingwood. And he's also very famous for planting more trees than anyone else alive in the state of Israel. Something something like that. Eh, close enough, close, close enough, enough. Yeah. close enough. All right, um, I, wanna, I wanna skip over to the lead. Because I had some stories about lead from when I was in grad school. But does lead what does it stand for again it's it's leadership in energy and environmental design it's it's designation by the u.s green building council just as you said is it real or is it a bunch of hippie stuff so it is it's a blend of it's a blend of each mm -hmm. so you've got this concept of, of being more sustainable be more efficient uh with the the natural resources but it also includes this this concept of being more efficient with the people resources that that's the bigger resource out of out of the two uh, from a business standpoint and also from a from a payroll standpoint. Um, so so it's a blend of the two, um, uh, environmental hippie um, uh, regalia uh, in, in operating, it's and it's <laughs> green, like hard, show me the money, green money, uh, uh, greenness, yes. Now, Rick, I'm doing what I do every single episode. I try to figure out how to get the video to play while we sit here. And sometimes we have someone here, sometimes not. So. I'm not that rude. I'm just trying to get that video so I can read the comments. But otherwise, I see in the other screen. So thank you, those who are, are joining us, our wives. Even better. All right, lots of people <laughs> watching. So do send us, uh, send us comments, send us questions. Uh, one of my favorite things, stories about Rick, is that he is Twitter verified. He has the blue check mark next to his name. I wish I had that. Okay, Rick, tell everyone, how do you get that blue check mark? I have no clue whatsoever. Uh, I woke up, and I, I, I wish for it. We, I think Justin even, <laughs> even spoke about this at length before this even happened. I woke up on Christmas morning during the campaign and checked Twitter, and I was Twitter verified. Hallelujah. And it was the most appropriate Christmas gift ever. <laughs> it's kind of like becoming platinum at your favorite airline, but it's better. And so, uh, so I'm very, 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 very pleased with that. There's a different lifestyle that comes, comes, uh, comes well, along with Okay, that. how has your life changed now that you are? Now that you're Twitter verified, things are just different. Things are just, so, so the the big benefit is you're, is is during yeah. the campaign, mm -hmm. um, I would not get alerts from people, some from haters mm -hmm. that were talking trash about me and being very derogatory about me on Twitter, uh, because I just didn't get alerted because they weren't verified. And so uh, I remember um, it was it was a couple days after Christmas. We were in Corpus and the kids were answer, were opening presents. And I was sitting there. I thought, you know what? Let me let me Google myself, but let me search myself on Twitter. That was a bad idea. <laughs> don't don't yeah don't there, search there, yourself. There was some vulgarity there uh, from my my fellow Houstonians, and uh, but it just didn't show up because uh, I, I didn't get their get their alerts. I told Rick. I told him. So, and I'm still trying to get this video with the comments going. It was driving me crazy. Uh, I told him. 
don't read the comments. If for any kind of video, that's the best part. If you, that's the if best you, part. If you watch like you're, if you're if you're on TV and there's and they simulcast, it's on Facebook. Don't read the comments. And so I was seeing a real good one day. I thought, you know, I'm doing really well. <laughs> so I start and I see I have eighty something comments. I start reading through them, and the first one said, "This guy's a used car salesman." <laughs> Uh, this other person said, "What what office is he running for? I don't think it's in America." It was something. It was something like that. It was so. It was so absolutely outrageous. I couldn't get over that. All right. Um, which church are you a deacon at? So I'm a deacon at Kingwood First Baptist Church. We've been there for 11, 12 years. Uh, so my wife and I, Shannon and I, we've been attending there for for about that long, and we we really like it. Mm -hmm. And so a, a, de a deacon is someone that that serves. Uh, uh, the church, the church body. It's not a voting type of uh, type of position. It's not one of authority. It's one of service. Do you do you have to have a, a degree, a certification, a training? No. Well, so you go through through a little bit of vetting. Um, they ask you very very personal questions, um, and uh, they meet with you and your wife, to make sure that you know the uh, standards by which to live. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, and so then if you if you pass that, you go through a a grueling. Uh, uh, Anywhere from a few minutes to a couple hour uh, uh, question taking type of session with fifty guys in the room, the other deacons, and uh, if you pat, if you go through that and they okay you, you get a or, ordained, you become a deacon. Is it is it pass or fail? It is pass or fail. I do not think it's majority vote. I think I think it's all or nothing. I really do. Did you ever compare your score becoming a deacon with Kevin Roberts' score when he became a deacon? <laughs> so you could say who is the most deacon? Well, I, I I think I think Kevin may have a slight mm -hmm. disadvantage because he is uh, he probably went in a little bit before me, probably got ordained a little bit more conservative time in the Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. The Baptist Church is very very liberal these days. It's it's really it's really quite shocking. Uh, so I think I think he probably got a probably got a little more tough a lot tougher than I did. Yeah. Oh, so so polite. He's such a let's call him a politician. All right. So you went to school, Southern Nazarene University. Uh, Rick grew up in Corpus, if you weren't familiar, and so he went up there where he met his wonderful wife, one of my favorite people, Shannon, that Shannon's watching, who's also from Corpus. So when I, when I kind of put those pieces together, and then I know that Rick's father-in-law also went to Southern Nazarene, mm -hmm. and I said, Rick, be honest with me, did you, did you follow Shannon to Southern Nazarene? And he said, no, 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 no. But I thought, I thought it was kind of cool that you, you're all from the same town, yeah. and then you went to a different state you know it must have been a 10-hour drive whatever it might be yeah, in there yeah. you're from the same place well it's a seven-hour drive for some of us okay yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, it might be. Not, not, not that i want to don't want to brag or anything but so yeah so we grew up, grew up in corpus very very small town about 350,000 people or so only three of these little nazarene churches there less than probably 300 people that are nazarenes in corpus never met i met shannon's sister shannon met one of my uh, my only sister not one of my sister one of my only sister and uh, but they, so we knew each other a little bit after there, but we never met directly. So I was a senior in college in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Shannon walked into the band hall. We were both in jazz band and concert band, and uh, and we met there. What'd you play? Uh, I was a trumpet performance major uh, for most of my time, and uh, before I became a music business ma major. And Shannon was an accounting major. Okay, so Shannon is the practical side of the house. So yes. what is a music business major? Okay, so I'm not qualified to do anything really. So okay, so I show I show up at college. Bear yeah. in mind, we are actually in Rick's office. Go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. So um, I show up at college, and I don't I don't really want to be there. And, and so I asked them, "What's the easiest thing for me to graduate with?" They said, "Well, we're starting this new music business program. It's for people that want to go and record engineering. We really don't have a clue what we're doing. It's the first year. We don't have a syllabus. So if you want to sign up for that, it'll probably be pretty easy." So I said, "I'll do it. I'll do it." So, because my own, my own skill that I had was was playing the trumpet, so I thought I'd do that, and then also be a trumpet performance uh, major, minor. So I went through college and did that. On the other hand, I married up, and that she got her accounting degree, and then went and got her master's in accounting, which really helped. So uh, yeah, so she's all, the only person that's actually qualified to be in the workforce. <laughs> yet I'm the one in the workforce, and she's the one. Uh, uh, doing all the really important work at the with the kids at home. Now, bear in mind, Rick has run this company for 20 years now. Yep, 21st year. 21st yep. year. That's pretty cool. Uh, all that from a, a music major. Yeah. Business. Well, music I'm unhirable. I'm unhirable. You had to start your own company. Yeah. I yeah. get that. Yeah. Okay. So 
Do you still play the trumpet now? I don't. I can pick it up and, and, and play pretty decently. I'm pretty sure we're going to do a fundraiser for, uh, <laughs> for Crenshaw. We're going to do it. We're going to do it at a dry bar and Rick will play the trumpet. A dry bar as an alcohol-free deacon-friendly bar yeah, that's or right. dry like we're going to get blowouts? No. <laughs> I'm not sure which is more appropriate now that you, <laughs> now that you bring that up. All right. So, but, but we'll have to have Kevin come, though, <laughs> to get blowouts with us. <laughs> I hope Kevin's watching. I hope he is, too. Uh, by the way, yeah, now that I finally have the, the video going and I can read the comments, please, if you have a question, you have a comment, I will ask Rick. Let's go back to Houston Real Estate. Uh, we all know it's booming. It has been. It has its ups and downs. Oil crashed. Didn't really help the market too much, but I would argue it has strongly rebounded. So how would you say the Houston marketplace, real estate market, is changing? Well, so you have an ascendancy of office space right now. The, the mm -hmm. office space is starting to fill up. Uh, it's a very, very good time right now to be, a, be an investor. Uh, the drawback is you've got retail. It's getting hit hard by, by Amazon. Uh, Isn't retail just, having a comeback? Well, it's had a little bit of week. Yeah, but you want to have right, right now. If you're an owner in Houston, and you say you own a, you own a mall, mall or strip center, you do not want to mm -hmm. have a product based business, a bunch of products businesses in there. You want to have service based business. You want to have a stylist. You want to have a restaurant. You want to have a cafe. You want to have stuff like that that can uh, not be easily replaced by by Amazon. That's the biggest uh, issue um, with uh, with the retail side, in my opinion. Um, now I'm not I'm not giving any advice or anything, but uh, from from what I see just just through reading the publicly available research is that there seems to be a, a overabundance of money in the marketplace to purchase assets. So there's a run on the assets, the office assets, and the investments there. And so you probably see that investment making as well. It's all day long, lots and lots of cash. People are looking to deploy that cash. If there's not enough things to buy, though, I wish that they bought everything that I had for sale. Yeah. That's the way it goes. All right, let's switch over. Part of real estate flooding. Uh, Rick's house and Rick's family is flooding. Uh, flooded. Sorry, they're flooding right now. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> we might as well finish the show first because you are more. High, you're far more highly educated than I am. So I've got to call you on that one okay. thing. All right. Well, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> so, what happened when your house is flooded? Were you home at the time? Yeah. 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 So. We were at home going through Hurricane Harvey. Rick uh, is in Kingwood, of course. In Kingwood, yes, yes. Uh, we've got a home that we've been in for about had been in for about four years at that time. We have three little girls, uh, five, seven, and ten. Mm -hmm. So we're at home weathering the storm, and uh, there was a little bit of break in the storm, um, and so I think that we actually went out and went to main event in Humble. Uh, but that's a bowling place. The bowling place. We went bowling, and I think we played a little laser tag and some games during a break in the storm during during the hurricane. Um, and uh, and so we drove back home and, and start see streets flooding. So the next day, I think it was the Monday, perhaps, uh, kind of the finale of, of all the rain. Um, we were at the house and we saw there's of course rain sitting uh, in the street and mm -hmm. running off a drain and and so forth. And and so Monday night rolls around and the rain stops. And we start seeing the the water start to build in the in the street. Well, it hasn't rained in six, seven hours, eight hours, nine hours. Where but, is this coming from? Yeah, where's it coming from? weren't That's you right. weren't you watching the news? I guess you weren't. You're out bowling, but weren't you? <laughs> I was glued to the TV. Yeah. We were lucky. We didn't lose power in Atascacita, and we were close to the lake. But we were we were very fortunate, mm -hmm. right? But we just kept watching and watching. We knew it was coming. But I guess you're bowling. Okay, so the water's right. You're at home. Yes. And then what, what time is this, give or take? So so about 10 p.m., we put, we had the kids in bed, and Shannon and I were, were thinking about going to bed, and we went and looked at the front yard. And the water would, had filled the street and was already halfway up the yard. And it had rained in a number of hours. And so we thought, you know what? We better make some precautions, uh, take some precautions. So we started getting the, the pictures on the on the first floor. Shannon mm -hmm. called a friend of ours um, who actually did this beautiful painting behind us, uh, Dorada. And uh, uh, she, her home has flooded three times now in uh, uh, in Bel Air, and so she said, "Take bring all the, the the outdoor furniture in and put all your good furniture on top of that, so you've got a little bit of a room that the water just coming to the house. You can save mm -hmm. it." So we started doing stuff like that. So we worked to probably maybe five a.m. in the morning, and the water kept coming up. And so uh, we were you up this whole time? I was awake the whole time. So five a.m. Uh, rolls around, and I thought, well, I'm going to go and lay down. So we brought the kids downstairs to sleep um, in an extra bedroom downstairs, and uh, it was a wood floor bedroom uh, right by the right by the outside window. 
and I decided that I needed to sleep there. So I slept on the floor so that I could actually feel the water come in sure. to make sure the kids were safe because I wanted to be woken up. So uh, we woke up, I maybe got an hour and a half sleep, maybe two hours sleep. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at it and saw, and saw the water was getting ready to come in. So um, our, uh, our good friend, uh, Jarrett Chester, came in his boat and uh, mm -hmm. came and picked up Shannon and the girls. And uh, by this time, our neighbors were kind of getting up a little, little concerned. And they were, uh, for the most part, maybe 30 years or 40 years older than, than us. And so uh, I started waiting out and, and checking on them, make sure, trying to turn the electricity off, trying to turn the gas off where I could, trying to encourage them to get out. And so I stayed back. Shannon and the girls went out on the boat with Jared uh, and went to go stay at their house. And I stayed there for a couple more hours. So I, I took my coffee pot upstairs and made, <laughs> made a cup of coffee and warmed up and uh, went out to check some neighbors, came back. And once the water started getting into the house, um, uh, and I, I looked across and saw some of my neighbors who said they would not evacuate, evacuate, uh, all six houses on our street, uh, were, were gone except for me. Uh, I went ahead and took a boat out. And so, uh, so we ended up getting, uh, between a foot and two mm -hmm. feet, um, uh, in, in the house. Uh, lots of comments coming in and we're going to talk about, uh, the flood bond and everything coming up. So I do see Great. the comments. So, um, the question I want to know, and a lot of people want to know, will Kingwood flood again? Uh, I, I suspect, I suspect it might. I suspect it might. I don't know. That's not a, that's not a, a yes or a no to your, your question, but I, I, I think it's more likely that it will flood than it won't flood. Um, you see a number of issues. Uh, you know, I'll just tie, I'll tie in the bond situation here where you've got this two and a half billion dollar bond that could be leveraged potentially up to about eight, eight and a half million dollars, depending on how the, the matching funds go. Uh, it doesn't address the primary culprit for flooding in mm -hmm. the Kingwood and, uh, and Umble area, or really Kingwood area, uh, which is this thing called the mouth bar. Mouth bar is a big sandbar that sits just due east of uh, Westlake Houston Bridge, and it's responsible for approximately half of the flooded houses in Kingwood. So, uh, and, that's, and this is the bar that's just, I don't know, less than half, that less than 100 yards from my house. So that's that's the bar that stopped the San Jacinto River and diverted it through our neighborhoods. That's right. And so this uh, this flood bond is not going to cover that. And so that, that's a big, big issue. So Paul is asking, what are the best possible projects you foresee out of the flood bonds? Well, so the, the Tanner Gates is the big thing. The Tanner Gates on, on Lake Houston, that's the that's probably the most important thing, I think. Uh, I'm not sure if they're if they're going to build, uh, you know, five, seven, ten. Let me gates. show you some inside information. Yes, yes I have. please do. I won't tell you where I got it from, uh, but the it's been decided. Whatever decided actually means ten. Ten. Ten, ten will be built. I said over what time period, and there's <laughs> who knows. <laughs> uh, it won't be tomorrow. I think we all know that, but. Ten Tanner Gates will come in. So it's breaking news. It's breaking well, news. Wow. Uh, maybe I got ahead of this. Well, maybe I wasn't supposed to say that. But it was. I was told about two weeks ago. So you can believe me, not believe me. I hope I'm correct, and the information I was given was correct. Now we're gonna say it's breaking news we'll call, right now, we'll right now on the Justin Lurie show. Yeah, I was pretty upset with the Paul Manafort breaking news today, but we'll move on from that. <laughs> I was. I was pretty upset about that. All right. Um, I'm just reading the other ones here. All right. And then Phyllis is asking. What can we do to prevent more flooding in Kingwood? Uh, we got to take out that big mouth bar. The mouth bar is approximately, I don't know what it is today, it's growing every day, but it, it might be between 15 and 20 acres wide. And, and you know, it, it's a lot of sand. It's all yeah. sand. And so that's, that's again, the number one thing we got to do. Number two, the Tanner Gates, number three, mm -hmm. we've got we've to end the sand pollution. Of course, they're, they're dredging right now. Uh, we need to do some more invasive dredging and also do maintenance dredging. Uh, we've got to take care of the sand mining operations and give those guys an incentive to uh, to clean up their mess and and, and retain their their, mm -hmm. uh, their stock, their inventory of sand. That's right. Yeah. Don't don't give us sand. Keep your sand. All right, let's move over to trading tariffs. Uh, Rick's a business guy. He has opinions. Uh, so, are we doing the right thing by imposing high tariffs against certain countries and or products? Okay, so that's a, that's a very very loaded question, very wide. Too. Yes, which can be answered by with a yes or a no, but I'm gonna yes. I'm gonna go to some detail here. Okay, so so as a um, as a believer in the Austrian model of economics, I am not a fan 
of you sound tariffs. Like Crenshaw, by the way, for trade. <laughs> and he got. He, That's not like Crenshaw would say. Yeah, uh, back at Harvard, <laughs> we talked about the Austrian model of economics. <laughs> That's and now that I see Rick saying that, I feel like maybe we hang out with Dan too much. <laughs> <laughs> so. I don't. I don't like tariffs. I don't like any government That's intervention, right. especially especially in business and trade. I want. I'm a free trader, through and through. But sometimes, mm -hmm. tariffs and trade restrictions can function in the form of diplomacy. It can function as a precursor and a possible prohibitor of war. And so, I see certain instances where you'd want to have a a trade uh, a tariff as a tool, including maybe currency manipulations here and there, as a tool to, to fight um, a, a, an enemy or a perceived enemy at, at certain points. In other words, your trade tariffs are weaponized. Yes. That's the word du jour right now, weaponized trade tariffs. It works in Turkey. It does. It's, I, I'm, I'm for this until we can rebalance our trade. We can go through different countries. How about this? How will the trade situation resolve itself? I'll name the country. You tell me what happens. Give me your uh, okay. Your prediction. Okay. Okay. Uh, first one. Well, uh, we said Turkey. Let's say Turkey. What's okay. Happen? So President Erdogan, which he's really a formerly dictator now. Uh, he's, 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 a dictator. He's, he's almost a dictator. He's, he's, he's a dictator. Yeah. So he had he has elections early, so so he can call consolidate power. Um, they are not going to come out here, come out of this very, very well. Now that, that's unfortunate because you want a, a very crucial country like that that's essentially buffering mm -hmm. Europe from the Middle East. You want them to be somewhat strong, be able to. Uh, they are a NATO member. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so that that's a little bit of an issue. But I also do understand the situation with Pastor Brunson being in prison for what was it three years? About that, something like that. Now he's in home confinement. This is a lot of lot of risk for no reward for these guys. I mean, I know they're, they're, he's taking a stance. Saying, I'm not going to release this guy uh, unless you let the let the tariffs off. But it's just suicide. Of course, he's trying to go back and negotiate with with the EU, and, and he's, he's not going to get anywhere with there. And he's trying to cozy up the Putin. Yeah, but they're not friends. They're no. not. I think it's just for for relations. And he's also looking at the weapon system. To buy out of Moscow. At the same time, we are supplying Turkey, a NATO member, with the J35. What a nightmare. It's going to continue the downward spiral, but Turkey will have no options left. They'll resolve it. Uh, next one, our friends up north, way up north, Canada. Oh, your, your, bro your brother Justin. Justin yeah, Trudeau, Trudeau up there. Yeah, Trudeau. Trudeau. Is, that, is that how you pronounce it? Trudeau. You know, I say this a lot. YouTube, look it up. Justin Trudeau falling downstairs. Really? Oh, gosh. It's... Uh, <sighs> The guy. Can we get the production team to roll that? <laughs> yeah, we, we need we need a bigger team. Put in the queue. Put in the queue. We need it. We need to pay them more. It's it's he, he. I say this a lot, but he. There's a video out there. He's explaining that when he's at a party, and this is maybe I don't know how many years ago. He was younger, twenty something, early thirties. I don't know. And he's explaining that when a party's boring, he'll walk over the stairs and he'll fall down the stairs just to liven things up a bit. <laughs> That's your that's your prime minister of Canada. Okay. Well, well, this is this other example of the type of guy that he is. He, I guess he's chairing the the G the G seven this year, and uh, uh, didn't we just have that? Yeah, we just had it. He chaired yeah. it, and then like a, a day or two later, he he knocks uh, he knocks Trump for the for the tariffs. But he didn't he didn't say anything while they were all together. He said well, we're going to play peacefully. We're going to do this. We're going to mm -hmm. do that. And then and then he hits it for him. So I don't have any room for this guy. So I think that approximately twenty percent of their. Um, Imports come from, or twenty percent of their GDP is exported to, to the United States. That's right. I think something small, maybe two or three percent, maybe five percent export there. It, it they're not going to have any effect on us. So um, I think he's going to have to give in at some point. Yeah. So no, I hear some in the background. I thought, are we alone in this building? Or <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the Green I, Efficient team. You know, it's yes. it, it's a seven. They're working on, hard. On, yeah, they're it's Tuesday. Work, they're working hard. Hey, that's okay with me. Uh, it just kind of scared me for a moment. I know you can't hear that on the microphone, but yeah, I thought, well, who's who's walking around behind me? <laughs> <laughs> All right, next one, uh, Mexico. Okay, so this this is a little bit more complicated, right? So you've got you just had your presidential elections. You've got this. Is it Bor Borra? I forgot. Or, yeah, some some guy, some guy. So mm -hmm. he's 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 got a six year term. He can't run for reelection because they're forbidden for doing that. So he's he's a six six year lame duck president of Mexico, but he's got a lot more power than Trump does uh, comparatively uh, in his in his country. 
uh, these guys are just going to get punished. They're just going to get outright punished. I know they're trying to find other avenues for their for their trade, but uh, unless they're willing to renegotiate the mediation clause in NAFTA, mm-hmm. they're they're going to have a hard hard six years. I will take an opposite approach. Okay. Uh, the deal with Mexico will probably resolve in the next couple of days. I, so. I bet. I bet by next Friday we have a, a substantial deal with Mexico, and we'll force, to build ten tanner day gates on Lake yeah. Houston. Well, gosh, if it gets here tomorrow, I don't care where it comes from. <laughs> and um, and Mexico will come to the table. We'll have a we'll have a kind of a joint memorandum, if you will, and then we're going to force Canada to negotiate and start pushing it. I mean, the, the thing is, what's funny with Canada, I mentioned this a lot too, is that Trump said, all right, well, let's just push all the tr- tariffs to zero. Why are you charging 250% for your milk and eggs yeah. out of out of America? Yeah. Explain that, why eggs have to cost five bucks a dozen up there. Okay, final one, China. What happens? Uh, so so this, this this gets a little bit complicated. So you've got an issue there where people are, people are saying, people that are, that are smart people mm-hmm. uh, say, well, they've got two thirds of the GDP of the United States. They've got about $11, $11 trillion GDP. Mm-hmm. The US only has 18 trillion. They can put some pressure on us. We buy a lot from them, they buy a lot from us, but there's still a, obviously a trade imbalance. Uh, there's some issues there. There's also an issue with their debt. Their debt is just astronomical um, and they don't have any plans to be able to deal with it in an efficient. Sounds familiar. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Uh, have you been talking to my wife? <laughs> <laughs> Joe, Joe Cunny. And, and so, um, so they've got this debt issue, they've got this GDP issue, but they also have this issue where their GDP has been inflated. Their growth has been inflated for so long. Their, their GDP growth last quarter was six point seven percent. The quarter before that was six point eight percent. But when you go back and you look at the hard numbers, you look at the look at the rail carriage, you look at the uh, the ship carriage, you look at the the cement purchases. Mm-hmm. Their GDP is probably only about three three and a half. And the the big the big thing that concerns me about that is whenever you ask their the Chinese labor you know Bureau of Statistics, how do you break, how do you get this six point seven percent GDP growth? That's just it. Trust us. There's no there's no breakdown of the GDP growth. So so that's a that's a huge issue because we don't know what their GDP growth is. Now let's backtrack that. So if if smart smart people are saying that they have an 11 uh, 11.8 uh, trillion dollar GDP and they've been fabricating their GDP and we know about we know about the rules concerning um, uh, uh, you know multiples of, of of trade you know year after year and all that all that increasing. Um, uh, we will have an issue with saying them that they even have a ten trillion dollar GDP, let alone maybe an eight or a seven trillion dollar GDP, which is probably what it is. So I suspect we, our GDP is triple what theirs is, and they've been buffering, they've been putting some some cushion in what their GDP numbers are the last 15, 20 years. In addition to the currency manipulation, mm-hmm. and uh, we're going to be able to push them around a little bit. Uh, but how does more. it end? So it will end in a debt crisis, I think. I think it'll end up being a debt crisis, and I think it'll be ten years from now. I don't think. I don't you think, think we're going to have this tariff um, head to head for yeah. the next ten years, even though there is a there is an entourage coming from a vice minister and whatever the heck they're going to come. You still think it's it's not going to come to a, a conclusion? Yeah, yeah, I do because I I don't think it's going to come to a conclusion because I don't I don't see any way out of it um, for those guys because they've been they they would they would essentially have to meet admit that they're in a weak bargaining position and they're not willing to do that because it's been lying for the last decade. Well, this is where you're wrong. Okay. I just want to say that. Okay. Now, I, 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 my prediction is December, there will be a, a comprehensive agreement. It's going to be after the midterm elections. There is not going to be a changeover. The Republicans will hold the house. The Republicans will probably pick up two, maybe three Senate seats. It's going to give Trump uh, a strengthened mandate if they didn't have one already. So the Chinese will look at this and say, we can't have another two years of this. Let's try to do it now with our lame duck, Mm -hmm. uh, meeting the Congress, the lame duck Congress in December of 2018, before the new ones are sworn in in 2019 where they're going to be more aggressive. China will make an agreement to try to savage their fourth quarter because obviously they're a retail producing nation. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're going to want to try to get something good for the final couple weeks and get a good push out there trying to make their market soar. So come December, we'll see who's right. But what's going to matter is that people vote, let's say, correctly. 
yes. uh, in, in November. All right, next uh, topic. Oh, by the way, Paul, uh, Paul here loves your Austrian model of economics. <laughs> thanks, Paul. Yeah. Paul, oh, thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening, Paul. All right, we're, we're still talking. Now we're going to go from trade and tariffs. We'll go to foreign policy. Some of my favorite topics here. Uh, DPRK, Democratic People's Republic of Korea. That's what it's called, right? That's what it stands for? Yeah. yeah. Uh, will they create, let's call it a comprehensive agreement again, with South Korea and the United States? Will this happen in a, let's call it a reasonable amount of time? Yeah, so it's all dependent on the Chinese The Chinese question, I think. I think I think those will, those will fall in line. I don't think mm -hmm. they'll have them spaced dramatically far, far apart. Um, I also uh, think I read today that the IAEA said that there's no signs that they've started denuclearizing any of their uh, any of their facilities. They won't. Yeah. Yeah. Why would they? Yeah. It's the only. Do they want to end up like Gaddafi? Do they want to end up like Saddam? No. They watch that. They watch Saddam get taken out of his hole and hung, and we all know what happened to Gaddafi. That was ugly. And they said that won't happen to us. We're not getting rid of that nuke. We're going to have. We're going to have an agreement. Will be a non-aggression agreement. And we'll, we'll trade non-aggression for economic development, mm -hmm. and they're going to have a win-win, and they're going to keep the nuke. Am I right or wrong? So I, I'm, I'm, a little bit, I'm a little bit on this. So earlier today, mm -hmm. I, I, was, I was thinking about the North Korea versus South Korea, what's going what's gonna to happen there. I thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, as a tiebreaker, I'm going to eat some Korean food today for lunch. So I looked at the reviews, mm -hmm. found a Korean place, went and looked at figured if it was good Korean food, the South would win. The South and the U.S. would win. But if it's bad Korean food, the North was going to stick it out a little bit longer. I think you just succinctly said how we lost our election. May perhaps, <laughs> perhaps, but there's got to be a tiebreaker. There's got to be a tiebreaker. Because <laughs> we base it off there. Oh, speaking of food, before I forget, I want to thank Rick for also going to El Tiempo last week. Rick, I think, went for every single meal to try to bake that, re break that ridiculous boycott. I mean, the AG eats at the restaurant. Yes, yeah, celebrate it. Take That's some right. pictures. Boycott them. Ridiculous. Thank you for going. We went too. Yeah, I'm just trying to do my part. Just trying to do my part. <laughs> I'm trying to help yeah. America one restaurant at a time. Okay. So what happens with North Korea? Um, I don't know. I again, I think I think it's tied to China, and I think it's I think it's probably a number of years away mm -hmm. uh, before we get some sort of conclusion to that. You think it's going to be kind of strung along like we have for decades? Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe maybe Trump's second term if we're lucky. All right. Here's the most difficult question. How do we solve or should we solve the crisis in Syria? You okay. can punt if you know. I mean, I don't even have an answer. No, no. So, all right. So this is a question of theology, uh, of, of, of Islamic theology, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we talked about on uh, the campaign trail, uh, the hardcore, the, the true Islamic believers uh, believe that uh, the Mahdi will come and he will he will put Jesus Christ they make Jesus Christ a servant and that's how it'll start to accumulate power of course there'll be, some, there'll be a lot of bloodshed and, and so forth but if 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 these are true Islamic fighters over there they can't be won over by dip with diplomacy including economic uh, provisions they have to be defeated. They've got to be defeated. And so um, I suspect that these are not the kind, nice, neighborly mm -hmm. uh, Muslims that we're used to here in the United States for the most part. I think these are probably uh, these are probably true believers and uh, there's got to be some got, got to be some warfare there. So I, I think that's what's got to happen. Impossible question to answer. If we had answers, it would have been done by now. Uh, all right. My favorite person to talk about. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. <laughs> uh, Rick and I were speaking last night, and I was sharing that I think some of my cousins live in her district, and I'm assuming they're probably enthusiastic supporters, yes. which they have every right to be, right? Yes. I wouldn't take that away from them. All right, do you have a favorite quote of hers? Oh, my. Okay, so I think it was last week when she said uh, that there are 200 – million uh -huh. unemployed people in the United States, and that <laughs> yeah. represents something like 80% of our population, or no, 40% of our population is what she said. And, and I think she said on Trevor Noah's show, which I don't watch, by the way, 
Because um, you DVR it, so I did, you watch oh, yeah. it, or you watch it later. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a big, I'm a big TV guy, and uh, yeah. um, and so I thought that, that was that that was hilarious. She also made the comment about the uh, the the reason why we have such low unemployment was because everyone has to work two jobs or three jobs or three jobs. Yeah, yeah, three jobs. Yeah, You're yeah. three jobs. So if you break down the the BLS numbers, only about four and a half percent of Americans work two jobs. <laughs> but we're all working two or three or four or five jobs to keep unemployment. Low. Everyone's watching. Uh, yeah, what's yours? What's yours? Uh, oh, so many. I know. How do you? Uh, my favorite is when she called Israel an occupying force. And then when she's challenged on it, she said, oh, I don't know anything about geopolitics. And it turns out she has a degree. And I have, I had this degree, too. So it really, it really offended me. She has a degree in international relations. <laughs> And I thought, well, she didn't get it from Michigan, so. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, oh. so, so apparently, she won. She won the election next door in the neighboring district in in uh, in New York as well. Oh, which via, her name via is Ryden. Via Ryden. Yeah. Via Ryden. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Before I move on from her, I want to get Ashley's question. Uh, you'll like this one, Rick. What's your favorite taco? Oh, oh, great question. Great question. So. It's a here comes a story. Yeah, yeah. So, so optimally, yep. a good, good like Friday night taco is you want to go to Lupe, you want to get your beef fajitas, and you want to load it up. Uh, mm -hmm. on, on I don't do the flour tortilla, I do the corn tortilla because I think they slip a little bit of flour into the corn tortillas at Lupe to make them so delicious. So, that that's probably the best go to taco. The thing about Rick that amazes me the most is that he's not 300 pounds. I think Rick goes out to out of there's 21 meals in a week per se. I think he goes out to 18 of them. Is yeah. that is that yeah, not yeah. right? Well, it's more efficient because you know I do want a company called Green Efficient, and I don't want to have to have dishes at the house. I don't blame you. Know, you. I, in I, fact, just eat out. I wish I could eat out as much as you do, but I, I, my body couldn't handle it. Like when we go on vacation, we eat out all the time. I think I put on 10, 15 pounds in a week just from. Not to mention the cruise. We won't get into that. <laughs> All right, let's go back to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, why has she gained so much traction and almost this universal name recognition among anyone who follows the news in the last month? Yeah. What is it about her? Well, it, this is, of course, coming from the same party where they their most exciting political figures of the last three or four years mm -hmm. were 70-year-old Hillary Clinton and 98-year-old Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. And and so so they're just happy to have someone that's a breathing, and b that they could show on TV. I mean, she's very TV friendly, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's she's enthusiastic. She's 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 very good looking. Um, she speaks clearly and a lot. Yeah, she, she speaks a lot. <laughs> she doesn't bite her tongue. I mean, she's yeah. she's happy to to be on TV. And she's got a great story too. She's got a great um, story about she and her mother and. Them, uh, I think, cleaning houses and waiting tables, and she became a bartender, and she worked her way up over the last, I don't remember years. What, what is she, 20? 28. 28, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, Ben, um, uh, with talk show, uh, uh, the, the young guy with the, with the Republican talk show, um, podcast. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not leaving it to dry, so Okay, no. okay. So no. uh, uh, Jewish guy. Um, he challenged her to a debate uh, with uh, – Oh, ben, ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro. There you go. There you go. Yeah. For $100,000. Yeah. Any charity she wants. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. She said she won't even respond. Well, she, she said, she said, I do not like it when people catcalled me like that. I've, I've earned my place in the world for men not to catcall me like that. Oh, I didn't hear that, but I wish I did. That's hilarious. Oh gosh! So so then so then on Twitter, uh -huh. I'm circling back here on Twitter. Uh -huh. Some guy um, who has a Democratic talk show offered Ted Cruz ten thousand dollars to debate him, and Ted responded, "Stop catcalling me." <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's a good time for a Ted Cruz plug. Uh, September 11th, I'll be hosting Ted Cruz at the American Petroleum Institute's monthly meeting, uh, Petroleum Club, 11:30. A few tickets left. Uh, we have 230 tickets, and I think we're up to, I think we sold 190, something like that. Wow. So September 11th, uh, api-houston.org. I hope that's correct. All right, uh, let's switch over. Let's talk about 
the way Rick and I know each other, of course. Uh, the U.S. House campaign. Awesome. Uh, this is this is my favorite question here. Favorite moment of the campaign. Oh my. Oh my. Okay. Um, I would say probably the favorite moment involved you, Justin. The favorite moment involved Justin Lurie. I'm honored. So during the campaign, toward toward um, uh, toward the primary, the time of the primary, early voting, um, we had to take a, a, a trip down to uh, down to Corpus and, and come back uh, the next day. So Shannon and I were in the car. We were kind of actually coming back from my from my grandmother's funeral, who passed away, and um, we were driving in the car and we were coming back into Houston, and I get a call from Justin Lurie for Congress, his <laughs> office, his office, and and so they. They, the, the lady that was calling to connect, just like the White House, connected me to the switchboard, connected me to Justin's secretary, then her secretary, then finally to Justin. This about, is about four about steps to reach yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. And so um, when I finally got through, um, about an hour and a half later. I was in a yacht. Justin said, <laughs> Justin said <laughs> um, my people just handed me a piece of paper, and it is a hit piece on you, Rick. Congratulations. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> And I thought, how fantastic is that? Because you got to remember, people that run for Congress are not people that have low self esteem. That's <laughs> no argument. <laughs> Any press is free press. Yes. And we were trying to get a lot of press during the during the during the campaign for anything. That's all we do. Yes. Yes. And this was the this was the first hit piece mm -hmm. that was a postcard that had a sign next to my head that said Satan, or like <laughs> go home Satan, or something like yeah. that, or not not today Satan is what it said. I can which picture is, it very which clearly. Is, which was the most fantastic thing in the entire world uh, for someone like me. Um, and so it was, I said, just, you've got to text this to me. So obviously I handed it, or responsibly handed my phone to my wife, um, who, who, who uh, looked it up for me while I was driving. And, uh, uh, and it was the most fantastic thing in the world. So that made my day. Uh, it was the best thing in the world. So the, the, <laughs> what I what I assumed was was that this verified our internal polling that we paid a fortune for. That hey, we're doing very very well. We've got a good shot of making this runoff, and we're gonna we're, we're right there. No one would be spending money attacking me without that. Come to find out, it was not out of strategy that that piece went out. It probably went out maybe just just for pure spite and for, for pure enjoyment. <laughs> Uh, that someone spent maybe uh, you know a total of half a million bucks uh, attacking me. Maybe it was like, hey, uh, you don't like Rick? Well, <laughs> I got an idea. <laughs> so so, uh, but I, I it's it was it's all it's all good now. It was it was that it was actually very 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 pleasing, very very pleasing to see that in the, in the next piece. And and uh, and uh, honestly, it really it really was a lot of fun to do. I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't take anything back. Yeah. All right. Um, Another good one. Most embarrassing moment of the campaign for you, for you personally, because there's no shortage of these. I wish there was, yes. but there's a lot of moments. What's yours? What's yours? All right. Yours. I went to, I went to a luncheon. It was a Republican Women's Club. You know, there, there are a couple, maybe what a dozen of those mm -hmm. in our district. I went to one of those and. And what they do is they allow you, if you're not able or unwilling, whatever it might be, if your schedule doesn't allow, you can you could just uh, be introduced and you could be on your way to your next event. And that's what I had. Mm -hmm. I had two or three bookings within an hour of each other. So I said, hey, I would, I'd love that. I'd really appreciate that. So they said, hey, write your name very neatly because we're going to read it when you get, and I said, okay. So I spent forever. No, my name has 11 <laughs> letters in it total. Right, and so I spent just forever. J U at, right, and so I wrote as neatly as I mean, it, it looked like it was printed by a, a typewriter or something. So then I went, and I, I, I in the sign sheet this is, and then I went and I mingled and stuff, and then everyone sits down, and then first the, they announced um, one of our competitors' uh, wives was there, and and she got up and she was like, oh hello, thank you, thank you, thank you. And they all clap for her. Oh, and they all, yeah, they all clap. Yeah. Right? They all clap. Yeah. And then, now I'm. They asked me to stand in the back, so I I was standing in the back, and this nice lady, um, you know, very very nice, but maybe she needs a different pair of glasses, and she starts reading, the paper, and she says, Jason. I thought, oh, <laughs> oh, this is me. Uh, 
G Jesus, I thought, oh no. <laughs> now I'm still standing there. I don't know, do I raise my hand? Do I wave? And now the whole room's kind of looking around like, hey, who's who's Jesus here, right? <laughs> and I'm still standing back there. Now I'm waving. Hello, hello. And she goes, um, John. Oh, gosh. Then she goes, Justin. It's Justin. Now I'm really, really waving. Yes, yes, hello. Now it felt like an eternity. And now the room still looking around. Now there's a little murmur, 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 right? So they're looking for Jesus. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Who knows what's going on? Then it's... Uh, Justin, Lore, Lore, as like it just it just keeps going and going, and I'm still standing here waving because <laughs> I don't know what else to do, and it keeps going, and then finally there's a polite little clap of ten people in a room of fifty, hundred people, and so I yell, thank you, <laughs> and then I left. And I don't think I've been back since. <laughs> so that was probably the most embarrassing so 30 you, seconds. And you may or may not know this. Sh Shannon went to the exact same club probably the same night because I couldn't go. I was at the same thing mm -hmm. for another event, event. And they mispronounced her name. Now, how do you pronounce Shannon Walker? I know she knows how to spell. Um, She's a CPA, of course. She, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they misspelled her name and the same Mm -hmm. Candidate's spouse came up and apologized profusely for it. It's like they did it intentionally. Oh. Craziest thing. It's but we're all friends now. We're, we're all, all friends hey, now. Yeah. We're all friends. Yes. All right. Most embarrassing moment for you. Oh my. Okay. Um probably um the most embarrassing moment where I was embarrassed, but the people around me didn't know I was embarrassed was um, uh, election night. We're having a big party. We've got all of our friends, all of our volunteers. Uh, a victory party. Victory party, because we, we, all the polls said we were winning. People were spending money attacking me. It was like it's like triple verification. It was a victory party. You, yeah. people, losers don't have victory parties. Yeah. Get hit pieces. And our polling said. And I think my mom voted for you. Your mom did vote for, it, for me, yes. <laughs> she yes, did yes. not. Just kidding. <laughs> well, your son voted for me. Yeah, Preston, my, Preston my voted son. for me. Yes, that's I'll I'll tell that story in a moment. Go ahead. Go so, on. so we are um, we're at this victory party, and I'm feeling good, feeling pumped up, and and going there and feeling good, and uh, talking to everybody. Place is place is packed, and and just you know just all my friends, all my all my family are there, and and all the volunteers are there. Just just a fantastic time, and uh, food's good, drinks are good. Look at my phone, and my mom. I oh, I bet's probably watching right now. Um, I love you, mom. Uh, I'm, I look at my phone. It's a text message from my mother in Corpus Christi, Texas. So a different TV network mm -hmm. watching national news. And she texts me a picture of the TV with my picture on it. With other candidates pictures on there showing me that I lost. <laughs> <laughs> so that is how I found out that I lost at my victory party was I got a text message confirming that yes, the entire country knew that I lost. Everyone knew that I lost, except for the people in that room who I then had to go tell that I lost. Well, how come you didn't have the results um, tablet like everyone else did? Well, we were we were doing that, but it was it was just so early on. I don't I don't know if they had some sort of it was just quant type of setup where they, they naturalized gotcha. or yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So Rick used to advertise a lot on YouTube before your video comes up, you get hi, I'm Rick Walker, right? Oh, I'm funny to keep Kingwood dry. Yes. All right, whatever it was. And so uh, Preston, my little guy, probably if you're watching, Preston would watch YouTube before he goes to bed. He watched, you know, Storybook Nanny and, you know, whatever Humpty Dumpty stuff. And before he would, uh, before the, uh, Preston's video, and this is every single night, but come on, it was always Rick Walker ads every single time. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rick Walker, and I'm running for Congress. And press would yell, my dad's running for Congress. That's dad's brother. That's what he'd always yell. Yes, yes. That's dad's brother. They're both running for Congress. And how old is Preston? Pre well, he's uh, he's four. Yeah. Okay. Press, press turned four during the campaign. So he's not voting age by, by no, any means. He wasn't either. So, so what, I, what I told Preston, the four-year-old Preston, was that on election day, I told him, I said, Press, I will agree to take off that YouTube pre-roll of me beginning tomorrow 
if you vote for me. <laughs> and he agreed to it. He agreed to yes. it. Yes. And uh, I, I kept my word. No more YouTube pre-roll. <laughs> he ta Preston talks about, uh, I say, the warrior, but Press calls him something else, uh, especially when we were in the Caribbean. After, we took a long vacation after the, uh, the election, mm -hmm. and we saw... Uh, Pirates, yes, per yes. se, and then press would yell out, "Oh, there's, there's Dan." <laughs> We're like, "Dan's a warrior, Preston, <laughs> a warrior," and he would, yeah, that didn't go too far. All right, uh, what is the one thing you would do differently in this campaign if you would do it all over again? So we definitely would have started the TV and the radio stuff a lot earlier. We probably would start. We, I think we started maybe late December or early January. Uh, for the March election day, we probably would have started um, late November, very, very early on, and we would have pushed more ballot by mail out. Uh, probably would not have done the polling because the polling caused us to spend a whole lot more money um, doing uh, counter uh, counter advertisements um, and uh, and to be more uh, meet more into the weeds, more into the minutiae of 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 who's going to place where, and uh, we really just need to promote. You know, this this is who we are. This is what we believe. So uh, those are probably the biggest changes uh, we would we, we make if we had to do it over again. In other words, you purchase the polling to give you strategic direction. Instead of making a turn this way, you turn that way because of the polling. So if you didn't have hired the polling, mm -hmm. you would have went in the right direction. That's right. So so the, the first polling, and I, someone could probably look at our FC, FEC finding the first round of polling. That early, it was in November, early December. It was like thirty grand. Thirty, you do a lot with thirty grand to tell you really nothing. Really nothing, yeah. Because it was November, and no one's really paying attention. Exactly. Except for a couple party faithful, right? Exactly. And people you already know. Exactly. Now, now, if you're in Harris County, and you understand politics, politics here, you know about the slates, the pay-to-play slates. But if you're a big, powerful DC uh, polling bureau. You probably don't have a, a mechanism to factor that in. And that's kind of important. But that's they really should they because should. this is this is America's third largest county. You should. Yeah. I mean, give me a break. Yeah. All right. Um, let's talk about your political future. I heard you're running for senator in Utah. <laughs> <laughs> Am you I? Could, Am you, I? Could, <laughs> you could totally stand in. If Mick can't make an event, you just walk in there and just don't let him zoom in with the camera on stage and just say, well, I'm Mitt Romney. <laughs> Here to make you talk right again, whatever whatever his slogan is. Uh, what do you, so you run the company, you had the company, you live in Kingwood. Where do you want to be next with your political career? Well, I really don't know. There, there's so many different uh, places to serve, you know, obviously local, county, mm -hmm. state, and federal. Um, right now, Shannon and I are just, just focused on raising the girls and, uh, and, and trying to uh, continue to be involved in our charitable work. Uh, so we, we don't have any plans. Uh, really, there's, there's nothing really that interests me right now either. I mean, uh, so we essentially built a lot of name ID in certain parts of the, of the mm -hmm. metro area and uh, have nothing to do with it now. So it's kind of, kind of, kind of interesting. How, how are you? What are you, what are you going to do after this? Well, I'm going to talk more about Rick's billboards. Uh, <laughs> are there... Rick is actually, I would say, the greatest businessman I know because he could buy a billboard for three months and get 12 out of it. He, he pays 25% the price. Uh, I drive down 1960 and I see Rick Walker, our values. For, I mean, it's still up. It was up. It is. Uh, it was up yesterday. It is. It was it still, is. I'm going to see, and when I drive home tonight, I'm going to see it again. Yeah. I'm going to say, I know that guy. And we say every time, our values. So it's okay. So, the, so these, uh, these political consultants, who do this full time? They come in and say, "Hey, we're, now you need to sign these billboard leases. You need to do this. You need to do that." Of course, I'm not. I'm not signing anything. They they are, and so um, uh, I said, "Well, now with the billboards. Now, what about the takedown policy? Well, you're going to have to pay to take it down. Well, the campaign's going to be over with. How am I going to raise money?" So then they would negotiate like the ones on 1960 mm -hmm. for some. There's no. There's. I don't have to take them down. Who's going to take them down? The owner's got to take them down. So then you get free advertising. You get free advertising. You get free told. advertising. Yeah. Yeah. And then we do the same thing with uh, uh, with website advertising through some of these local community things. They said, uh, "Now, Rick, now we're gonna we're gonna sign you for this massive package here." The consultant, the professional consultant, said, mm -hmm. "Sign for this ma massive, expensive package here." But uh, you got to understand, some of your competitors might come in here and try to do the same thing, so we got to get on early. I said, "Well, why don't you just write a non-compete clause in it?" 
we're going to repay you this money. You're, gonna, you're not going to sell it to our, we never, why, why would you do that? It's like, well, it's standard business practice. <laughs> if you buy the biggest, the biggest something a company offers, you, you get a knock and feed out of it. Yeah. So, so um, I'm actually going to be sending invoices off for my consulting services to the political consultants later on this year. What's the wackiest advice they gave you? <sighs> so, <clears throat> so, and I wouldn't say this is advice. This is kind of stuff we conjured up. So it's November, it's early. We hear rumors about people that are very, very well, um, well moneyed mm -hmm. getting into the race. And so I'm assuming that, hey, all the media's gonna be bought up. So I'm gonna start buying everything I get my hands on. Mm -hmm. So we start calling around and, you know, well, like all the local website companies would buy, get, get exclusives with them, get exclusives with certain uh, other media billboards, give me everything that's available. Um, uh, type, type of thing with, with a variety of these, these vendors. And, uh, and so we started buying up all this media, but we never bought any TV or radio that early <laughs> or mail that early. And so those are the three things we probably should have spent more money on. Um, and, and come to find out there was plenty, plenty to go around. I'm reading the comments as we go. Uh, Rick, is my polo here? Oh, wrong controller. Am I, uh, my horse guy? Is that thing too big? No, 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 no. You oh, want it's appropriate size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a giant one on his back. <laughs> That's the the one on the back is much bigger. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. See, I would have guessed when you told me at the, the consultants, I saw Rick five days a week for <laughs> yeah. five months. Yeah. And Rick wore the same suit <laughs> every single day. Yes. And and I must I'd probably wear probably a dozen, give or take. Yeah, because I'm wearing the same clothes every day, and I said, "Rick, why? Why do you wear the same suit every day?" <laughs> I said, "I know, I know you have a closet full of clothes. <laughs> why is it the same suit?" He goes, "Well, that's what my consultants told me to wear." Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. I need to, I need to wear the same. I need to wear the same suit, same suit, shirt, and tie combination. Yeah, and so I, we would essentially call it Rick's uniform. <laughs> we would say, "Hey, oh, hey, guys." Uh, uh, yeah, talk to Rick. He's the guy in the uniform over there. <laughs> Looks like a politician. So, so the funny thing about that is that you might. So my house flood at the end of August, September, October, we're rebuilding. November rolls around and the, the race starts. I don't own any suits. So I mentioned Wait, when, the house, what? when the house is flooding. Oh, the house is flooding. The house is Sorry. flooding. Sorry, yeah. What am I doing? I'm going to check on neighbors, and I'm upstairs making a pot of coffee while, while my house is being destroyed. I wish you were grabbing things of. So yeah, instead so of I, coffee. So I grabbed the creamer. And I grabbed the Splenda. <laughs> grabbed I needed a mug. I grabbed my I grabbed my uh, my Bush Reagan mug, and uh, went upstairs and sat down and had a nice cup of coffee before the boat came, and um, and my wife said because my wife cleaned out her closet. I said, "Babe, don't worry about it. We got flood insurance. I'm positive we have flood insurance. I always pay the check for the the insurance. That's all covered." Oh God. So I said, just leave it all down there. Leave it all down there. It's fine. I'm going to get all new suits. Watch this. I'm going to get a whole new wardrobe. You're going to be stuck with your old garb. Watch me. You know, just a smart guy. Well, come to find out, the insurance company does not automatically <laughs> renew your flood policy. And so we did not have flood insurance. And so my, I lost my entire wardrobe. I did happen to save about 12 pairs of swim trunks and a whole box of very, very nice pocket squares. That's it. That's it. And so that's all that I wore those two months while we were uh, in a few T-shirts uh, while we were rebuilding the house before the race. So we started getting the race. I went to the store and bought it. I bought two suits. I bought a gray suit and a dark blue suit. And the consultant, it was actually a political photographer up in the woods who's amazing, by the way. Um, he only does political portraits. Uh, he said he laid out. He sat down with me for an hour before our, uh, our photo session and said, "Rick, this is what you're going to wear: white shirt, red tie, no designs, no stripes, maybe some." Small design, dark blue suit, solid socks, no, no, no brown, but black, black shoes, black belt. That's it. Every single day of the week, that's your uniform. That's I can't. I just can't believe you listen to. Yeah. It. So I mean, he's a photographer. Doesn't mean he knows you should wear every day. It doesn't mean he knows what the people and 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 um, you just pick an area. You know that it, voters in in Kingwood and Montrose and West U and Champions and Klein. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what does he? What does he know? Well, he's in business. He's been, so, he's in so, I, so I so I own three blue suits that I that I circulated there. So I'm still suit poor. <laughs> so I still wear swim trunks every day every day to work. It's yeah, nice. well, if you yeah. own the company, who's going to tell you not yeah. to? Yeah, yeah, wear swim trunks to church too. Nice. Um, what know. what size? What oversized ball do you think that oversized polo dude is hitting? <laughs> Why? 
I give a. He's actually beating that horse. <laughs> he's not actually playing polo. Polo is a great sport. <laughs> well, actually, the polo season starts up again soon because uh, they take the summers off. Well, they, they play water polo in the summer, of course. Oh, I wish we could play water polo right here. Uh, let's see. I'm ignoring Chase's comments. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, just keep ignoring Chase's comments <laughs> as I read through. All right, let me go to predictions because we've been here for a while. All right. Uh, I'm going to name the race, and you name the winner and by how many points they win, okay? Okay. Um, Francis or Rourke versus Ted Cruz. I refuse to call him Beto. It's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. His name is Francis O'Rourke. He's trying to pretend he's something else. Just be who you are, buddy. He's an Italian, isn't he? That's that's what he is, right? Francis O'Rourke? Isn't he Italian? Or, is he, or he's a... Italian? Why don't, no, it would be Italian. 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 But that's Italian. what he's the Italian. 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 Italian? No. Okay. <laughs> no, so, he, Francis O'Rourke is about as Irish as it gets. Okay. If I got that wrong, I'm sorry, but I'm pretty confident. Okay. Okay. So um, I will go. I will cruise by by a point and a half. Point and a half. Yeah. And how many ticket splitters? Yeah. There's too much energy with with O'Rourke. Okay. Let me go back energy. to Abbott uh, Lupe de Valdez for the governor. Oh, Abbott by by twelve. All right. So Abbott's gonna win by I'd say 15, 15 to sixteen. Yeah. 15, 16, 17, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. But I just I just can't imagine there's that many ticket splitters in a statewide race that that Francis will get um, that many more points. I say Ted by seven. Uh, all right. Uh, Dan Crenshaw, you've heard of him, versus Todd the Kitten Litton. Okay, okay. So – this on paper looks like it's going to be uh, eight to ten point blowout, maybe a little bit more than that with with Crenshaw. Mm -hmm. um, Todd is Todd needs after he gets beat by Crenshaw, mm -hmm. he needs to go run in uh, a, a, a hard D. He needs to move and go run in a hard D because he's honestly a very very smart, capable person, right? We have very dumb, very liberal Democrats in Congress. It'd be nice to have a few smart liberal Democrats. In, Congress kind of offset that a little bit. That was nice of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, again, great guy, great guy, but he's he's going to lose. Um, uh, I'll give it uh, I'll give it 12 points. I said the same. 12 points, Dan over the kitten. All right. Um, the incumbent, Mr. Culberson versus Fletcher. Seventh district. I think, um, I think Lizzie's going to do it. Really? I think I think she is. All right. Here's my hair. Here's my argument against it. Is that if you look at the turnout in the primary, Colbert had Colberson had effectively no real competition. Ziegler didn't even make a website, from what I was told, and and Culberson received eighty percent of the vote in that race. But if you look at total turnout, more Republicans voted than Democrats. But the Democrats had millions of dollars, national attention every single day, and yet still not as many Democrats voted in that highly, highly contested primary. Yeah. So I would say that there's still more Republicans, just numbers. I say Culberson by five. Yeah, yeah. I think it, I think it'd be interesting to watch that because Culberson is actually, mm -hmm. I like the guy, but he's a like, negative energy compared to the other candidates that are, that are floating around out there. And so that's going to be really rough for him. I mean, he's, he's a little guard. Um, I think, uh, you know, David Blott was in the same race, so he jumped over to CD. He was in CD7 before he jumped over to CD2. That's right. I think Blott could have probably had an instant 40% there to start with. I really, really do. Um, so I think I think Culberson, if he wins, this will be his last term. He's got he's to hand it off to somebody else. I really do. And that could be you, Mr. David Blott. Yep, David you, Blott. You have our support. No question about that. All right. Um <laughs> Not commenting there, Chase. All right, Rick, plugs. Where are you going to be? What do you want to plug? Uh, I'll be at home later on tonight, but the kids are dead. <laughs> Speeches, uh, presentations, interviews. What do you have? Anything coming uh, up? Lots, of, lots and lots of interviews, um, uh, but they're mainly private, and they have to uh, comply with DOL regulations. So um, uh, nothing nothing, nothing public. I don't even know what that stands for. Department, Department, of, Department of Labor. Department of Labor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. So ha how about you, Justin? Tell me about all your activities. Well, you know I was going to – Get my plugs in. That's what I yes, do. Yes, please do. Please all right. Do. Um, all right. Michigan, my favorite thing. My alma mater, U of M. I'll be speaking there October 5th. We have one day confirmed and maybe 
uh, will get lucky in the business school, the Ross School of Business, which I think is still number one in the country. We're trying to plan a date so we can go there and talk about um, uh, equity investments and investment banking and uh, just what it's like to hang out with Rick Walker. So we'll have at least one speech there. If you're there, homecoming weekend at Michigan, that's one. Um, uh, Philip Aronoff. Yeah. Oh, we didn't yeah. do his race. 29th. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna toss say, up. All right. Yeah, I'm gonna say Philip. I'll say Philip. I'll say Philip. I say Philip wins yeah. by one point. Bring it home, Philip. Yes. Uh, September 25th. I know it's a month now, but we'll have another one in between. Uh, we're working on a date to have the Airline Pilots Association. We're yep. gonna, we're working on a date there. They're interested. Maybe, maybe we'll get to do it from the inside of a plane. Yep. Yep. That's yep. what I'm hoping for. And then. Uh, so so tomorrow, just, tomorrow yeah. is Kingwood Area Republican Women, uh, Ted Poe, I think is speaking. I will luncheon. be there. Oh, yes. yes. Walden Country yes. Club, where I live. I can literally walk there. Uh, we will, now we, the Kingwood, K-A-R-W, Kingwood Area Republican Woman, is hosting, uh, I guess, a celebratory farewell to Congressman Ted Poe tomorrow, 1130. 11, 11, 1130. Yes. yes. Yeah, Rick yes. will just pick me up. Yeah, yeah. Brooklyn, it's yeah. hot out. He'll spare yeah. me the walk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, so there's also tomorrow night is Empower Texans is having a, a happy hour. That's right. In Kingwood, in Kingwood at the draft uh, tomorrow night at some at some time. I'm going to that one too. I go there as well. We're going there. Yeah. Oh, and Chase, uh, Michigan is not the land of frozen cheese. That's Wisconsin. <laughs> oh, he said he could literally walk there, but he's going to ride his polo horse. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a story. There's a story that you that you told me last night about well, a Democrat who you met after the election, and Shannon was one. Oh, I want you to tell that oh, story. Okay, I went to we I went to uh, over the weekend. Yeah, this, this, yeah. Just two days ago, we were my family and I. We were at a, a function, and I ran to somebody who I I met once or twice before over the years, and he said, "Oh, you know, Jess, I actually live in CD too." I said, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. And I didn't know where he leans in the political spectrum, and I found out later. And he said, well, you know, I decided to vote in the Republican primary because I wanted to choose, have a say in who's going to win because he knew that it's a safe RC, yeah. right? And he said, I'm going to try to find the most moderate person and vote in that primary. And I said, I said, hey, did you vote for me? Just tell me I did so I feel good about myself, right? Whatever. Just just lie to me. And he said, he said, no, no. He said, I can't quite remember. I said, if I named you everybody, all the names, would you remember who it is? He said, no, give me the profiles. Remember the profiles. I said, all right. I said, uh, well, you have uh, the hospital CEO. You have the state representative. You have the Navy SEAL. You have a couple of attorneys. You have the attorney doctor, right? We're going through it. And I said, oh, and there's the, the businessman. Uh, who lives up by me up in Kingwood, you know, a uh, young guy, good guy. And he said, uh, he goes, wait, that guy. I said, his name is Rick Walker. And he said, uh, he goes, wait, yes. And I said, did you think Rick was the most moderate person <laughs> in the race? And he says, yeah, I thought Rick, he said a couple things that really, as a, as a liberal Democrat, really resonated with me. And I thought, this is a guy I can get behind. So Rick was the moderate, the most moderate in that race, and that's why I voted for him. And I thought, I can't wait to call Rick. <laughs> so, yes. That made my day. Crossover voter. You know what? I We were over at uh, we were at HGB uh, three nights ago at, eating at the new barbecue place built inside the HGB and ran into a, one? Yeah, and ran into another Democrat, young guy, uh, who who voted voted for me as well. So I'm getting all that. I think probably a third of my votes were Democrat voters that, that swung over to the Republican <laughs> race, just like Trump. Just Congrats. like Trump. Congrats. You're welcome. That means you would have won. You've done very, very well in the uh, in the general. See, when we were debating, I always said, Rick is the most far left out of everybody up here on this stage. <laughs> well, and I, to, be, to be fair, the one line I wanted to use the entire campaign that I couldn't use was that I am the only candidate from the Lake Houston area. <laughs> Until I found out where Justin Lurie lived. He lives in Lake Houston. So that would be very careful, very diplomatic. I am the only candidate from the Kingwood, Humble area. And I couldn't say it has to be the area. You couldn't say, you know, we have a humble address. 
Well, I don't, nah, I don't count that. You can't do that. that. All right, last story. This is one of my favorites. Uh, I'm out. I went to a club, and I'm standing at the front door greeting people, and it was uh, it was the Sunday before the official primary day. So we, yeah, yeah. Um, early voting was already was already uh, was already over, and so I'm greeting people that walked in, and I, you know, just say, "Hey, please, I really appreciate your support." And I spoke to this very nice woman. She goes, "Oh, I do know you. You know, you're Justin, right?" I said, "Yes." She said, "I heard you speak a few times. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan." I said, "Thank you very much. Thank you very much." I said, "Can I count on your vote this Tuesday?" She said, "Well, I already voted." I said, "Oh, well, did I earn your vote?" And she says, "Well, you're my favorite, but I don't remember who I voted for." So of course, I thought, "Well." I don't, I don't know what to say now. And I said, well, who well, kind of guy got me a little bit. I said, what happened? So she said, I went over to the, to the early voting center, and I remember seeing a big sign. I said, oh, I know what this is. <laughs> she said, I was a big sign for Kevin Roberts. And I said, okay. And I said, well, I'm your favorite. Did you vote for me? And she goes, no, you know what? I like Kevin's sign, and I voted for him. So I told Kevin the story a couple days later. Actually, it was on election day yeah, while we're yeah. standing there, you know, after millions of dollars have spent debates and traveling thousands of miles. I mean, poor Crenshaw ran 200 miles. Yeah. And here we are standing in a parking lot like this. Vote for me, oh. right? And so I'm hanging out with I'm hanging out with uh, Kevin for, for a little bit. And I told him the story. I said, Kevin, I think it would be fair and just and really the deacon thing to do is I think you all need to make me even, right, and then the plus one. Because that vote should have been the Justin category. So if you and your wife don't mind, could you <laughs> <laughs> could you two vote for Lurie? And he just, no. I said, okay, no problem. No problem. But that was, yeah. Yes. Other other awkwardness. Okay, and, of course, of course, Kevin, who ended up in first place in the primary, yes. was out in the parking lot wearing a fishing shirt. What neat fishing shirt and slacks <laughs> and like some sort of sandals, and we're out there in suits holding our signs. Yeah, and he smoked us. Yeah, and he and, smoked us. Yeah. So uh, lesson learned. Yes, lesson learned. Wear a fishing shirt. Yeah, just don't even just go golfing. All right, we'll call it a night. We'll call it a night. Thank you, everybody, for watching. This is a long show, but I had a good time. I hope yes. Rick had a Fun good time, time too. Time. And I hope you got to know Rick a little bit better. Okay, you can find Rick greenefficient.com, right? That's right. Green, uh, go get your building lead certified. Go buy some stuff. And don't forget to uh, vote Republican, vote conservative, and let's keep America growing. Right. All right, good night, everybody. All right.